don't need any of that stuff. My folks made me go to church when I was four years old. I don't care about any of that. But I said, buddy, you have no place to go right now but up. You're going down into the ditch. At least give them a try. See, even there, some would reject the precious love of the gospel of Jesus. Call on the name of the Lord to bless us, to join us together in holy worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained a servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins. All your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Old Testament reading for today is from the 40th chapter of Isaiah. We're doing verses 1 through 11. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, Cry. And I said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and, its, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fades, or the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Go up, go on up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the limbs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. This is the word of the Lord. Together, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Today's epistle is from the third chapter of Second Peter, and we are doing verses 8 through 14. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are awaiting or since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. 
This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter, where the Lord uh, speaks to us. In the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him by the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We bow our heads in prayer. Holy Father, we thank you for this time together. Open our minds and soften our hearts as you speak to us through your gospel, your Son, in these days. We ask it in his name. Amen. Like all of this, uh, the transitional gospel message where uh, John the baptizer, I call him the baptizer, that's what he did, but the word Baptist, I think, is a shortened version. But So John the baptizer is uh, introducing the Messiah. He's the, the bridge from something to something. And the from something is the people of uh, Israel around him and John the Baptist were kind of lost. They were all wrapped up in what these Pharisees, I call the Pharisees a modern day Taliban. You know, those dudes are all about rules and, and being onerous and overlording people. You know that, that Taliban. That's who the Pharisees were. And they were more interested in observing their rules than introducing the joy of the gospel of the Messiah that was prophesied way back in Isaiah. So that's what John was doing. He's telling people to repentance. Come on down to the river. I'm a strange dude. I am. I eat bugs and stuff. And I think some of the notoriety caused people to come see him. But also there had to be a bunch that were genuinely interested in their lives being changed. They wanted to be changed. And I'm not quite sure what the attraction was with him as far as that. He was an eccentric. and We all know that John was an eccentric. Uh, he was part of an old tradition that had to swear off wine and all the rest, grow long hair. That was his tradition. And really, really uh, adhered to the scriptures. Like no compromise in any way. Really a great soul. Matter of fact, Jesus said about John the baptizer that there's no human on earth better. He's the best. He said, no one is better than John the baptizer. And that's quite a statement. Since right over the edge over there, you can see men in their fine clothes, you know, their purple gowns and their gold epaulets and things and all of that place status. But John had none of that. And Jesus said, this guy is it. But Later on, he also said that whole form of humanity must submit to me, Jesus. Now, that's what we always have trouble with, submitting to Jesus. And in the Christmas season, we see lots of movies. You know, you can find them on streaming channels and all the rest about uh, the events. And But the events in the movies of today about the Christmas season very rarely emphasize that this new baby is the son, not, not a son, not one of them, but the only son of the living God. And once he's here on earth, there's no other. He puts to death all other religion, all other forms of it. Done. 
They don't deal with that. The movies and the songs and all the rest. Oh, sweet and nice and all that. Rock a bye, baby. But here we got the living Lord God coming to the world, and that's largely ignored. Now it's up for us to fill the gap, bridge the gap. Yeah, bridge the gap from standard way of life to the holy way of life under Jesus, where he promises his Holy Spirit. Wow. And the Holy Spirit then introduces us to the Father. He is the same one and the same Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Whoa. He intercedes for us when we don't know what to say, how to pray, what to do. He comes to our aid. He's comforting the Holy Spirit. How much nicer, how much more relaxing is that than the word of the Taliban Pharisee? Get right, just do that. And now oh, Jesus. Now Jesus was not opposed to fulfilling rules. Matter of fact, he excelled in all of the rules and regulations. He excelled. He was the best at it. He fulfilled all of them. That's the point. In him, we have everything we need before God. Fantastic. Now, in this particular account, this bridging account, where John the baptizer introduces his cousin, Jesus, to the world around, he says, I am not worthy of untying his sandal. Do we, we don't, most of us don't get that. Because we are Americans. We don't understand insult. But in the Middle East, they make a big deal out of insult. That's kind of a profession. How do you insult somebody so they don't want to talk to you ever again in the Middle East? So what's he talking about? I am not worthy of untying, John says, the sandals of the feet of Jesus. He's answering one of the basic questions. Now, who is Jesus? And what does he mean to me? Who is Jesus? And what does he mean to me? Talked about that in Bible study, the two basic evangelism questions. Who is he? And what does he mean to me? To John. John, the best person on earth, according to Jesus, was sublimating himself under the feet of this Lord. Now, we don't get insult as a, as a kind of a form of communication. But, let's see, um, a few years ago, I think it was like 12, 13 years ago, President George Bush II was in the Middle East. And some guy threw a shoe. Some of us might remember that. Threw a shoe at President George Bush in an, in an interview. And Americans were going, oh, no, he's being threatened. A shoe? <laughs> Shoes don't threaten you. You just got them out of the way. There's nothing to it. A shoe? Yeah. Because in the Middle East, a shoe steps on the ground, which is filthy, dirty, disgusting. And that's how you insult somebody. You pick up your shoes and shake the dust off. Remember, Jesus even said that if you go into a village and they don't listen to your gospel message, turn around and shake the dust, the filthy, stinking dust off of your shoes. It's a form of an insult. And yes, Jesus was not above or below insulting people. There's no law against that, by the way, in the Old Testament. You can insult people. So long as you can prove the insult is correct. Yeah. But we don't get it. We should. That shoe that the guy threw at our president was meant to be the highest or lowest form of insult. That's what it was all about. When John the baptizer is talking about untying the laces of the shoes, the, the thongs on Jesus' feet, he was saying, I am below, I'm crawling in the dust, the filthy dust, and I'm looking up to my Lord who loves me. This is what he's worthy of, this Jesus. 
He's worthy of me insulting myself. Wow. This John was quite a guy. And he teaches us a lot of things. And answering those questions. Who is Jesus? And what does he mean to me? So we must do that ourselves. I won't ask anybody to stand up. I've been to some churches, you know, independent churches and gospel churches where they do that. They'll stand up and give testimonies. It's kind of fun. But we need to deal with that in our own minds. Who is Jesus to me? Is he a baby that remains in a manger and never grows up? Or if he is a grown-up person, does he remain in our minds? A guy that says nice things, teaches some people, exonerates others, castigates others, because he does, he gets mad, Jesus. Is he that man? He's kind of relegated to one portion of society and world and history. A guy that, well, let's face it, Jesus of Nazareth changed the world. There's no bigger religious movement in the world today than the Christian faith. It's bigger than Islam. It's bigger than Confucianism. It's bigger than Confucianism. One man, he didn't start it. He didn't say, today I'm going to start a new church. He didn't say that. Today I'm going to introduce people to God. The kingdom of God is near and it's here. I am it, he said. Who is Jesus? A handy religious object? A form of worship that is just for us, Christians? Or is he actually the God of the universe? See, we must answer that. We must. I was uh, visiting with a, uh, I think he was a 23-year-old. And I asked him, I says, uh, hey, buddy, uh, we had a longer conversation, but I asked him those two questions. He was pretty chatty <laughs> until I did. So what you got to do is figure out who Jesus is and what he means to you. He went absolutely quiet. And as I review that, I think it was because he expected a Lutheran pastor to talk about church. Right? That's the easiest thing for Christian people to do. One way or another, good, bad, up or down, to talk about church. Church, duh. But I didn't want to talk about church stuff. That's a, uh, what do you call it? A red herring in that context. I wanted to talk about Jesus. So pull them back. Anybody like that, pull them back. Who is Jesus? And what does he mean to you? More and more I hear the phrase, um, I don't want any part of that organized church. Well, I was made to go to church when I was three, and I hated every bit of it, that organized church. And I thought, <laughs> I've been in this business over 40 years, and not too many churches have been organized. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure St. John is. Yes, I'm sure you are. Absolutely. But that's what makes church so fun. It's, it's it's not organized. It has rules and so forth. But we do that to keep things in some kind of order. Yeah. So we can get together and at certain times and do things. But when I hear this accusation, I'm thinking, buddy, you're talking about me. I'm from that evil, awful, organized church. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about Jesus. the one. The St. John the Baptizer crawled under his feet and looked up at Jesus, his cousin, and said, I, I'm not worthy to untie your feet. I am all by myself. I am insulted, willingly. Look up at you, Jesus, because you love me so much. That's what we want to do. That's what we're after. Not about church stuff. I mean, I was just kidding before we started, and every Lutheran church has a different way of doing something here and there. And many church bodies have different ways of doing things. That's not what we're talking about. Those are wonderful attributes. And as a matter of fact, I myself am so grateful that I got to be around 
organized church people. Is, again, if there is such an animal as that, because of that, because of that, my whole life has been changed, all for the good, all for the good. Get to meet people all over the United States, internationally, been able to travel, present the gospel in other languages. What I didn't know what the translator was really saying, you know, you hope. Wow. Now, I think after a while he was saying, is there any done yet? <laughs> yeah. That's what we're after. We make friends. We make friends. Not about what does our church do? What happens? We can. We want to get there eventually just as a point of information, but always bring the thing back. Who is this Jesus? And like John the Baptist, John never did say what? He never did talk about the great temple. He did not denigrate it, but he didn't talk about that. He talked about you and me. This is what you need to do in faith. Get baptized. And then he says, there's one coming, and he's great, and he's marvelous, and he's full of grace. And he'll give you your spirit, the one you need, the Holy Spirit of God. He'll give it to you. Because in times gone by, the only people who claimed to have the Holy Spirit of God were prophets. And now, from the time of Jesus and his resurrection, the Holy Spirit of God was distributed to every single human person that is baptized in the faith. That's us. And you know what? We have the same powers and abilities of St. Paul of John the Baptizer, of any of these characters in the Bible. We have the same powers, none different. It's all a matter of, well, I got a new truck out there. It's a big red one. I want to get a red one because I wanted people to notice me. That's bad though, right? Ministers shouldn't be noticed. But I like the idea. I want you to notice me so I can talk to you. Now, if I don't use, if I sit there and just talk about a big red pickup and never drive it, what good is that? That's no good. It just sits there. But when I turn it on and use it and try to find my way through all the confusing buttons and all that, then I'm using some of the power that it has, some of the attraction. Same for the Holy Spirit of God. Some of us, I'm not being mean, but under the law, some of us like to think that we're powerless. That we we never turn the key. And so our motors don't rev. Our spiritual motors don't go. But yet, we got it. We got the power. The Holy Spirit of God, Jesus, is telling us that. John says, you've got it. You've got to get it. And we're going to be able to do things that have never been done before, personally. Inside, I hope, the organized church. We can do powerful and wonderful things. And, most importantly, outside the so-called organized church. You and I are the outpost of the faith. Powered up so we can reach out, make friends, and share the gospel of Jesus that he loves us, he forgives us, and people need to hear that today, that he forgives us. You know, a while back, I was working in a, not working, I was the, on the board of directors for a, a facility for dual diagnosed people. I'm just be real frank here. They were diagnosed with drug addiction and alcohol addiction. They were at the bottom of their barrel. And those people came to us from all walks of life. Professors, people down on the dumps, all walks. They were court ordered to us. We were the last stop for those folks. We were the last stop. We treated them with Jesus. We treated them with all kinds of things, good looks and all the rest. We treated them. But what I noticed was, no matter how far down the barrel some of those folks were, they still said what to Jesus? Don't need any of that stuff. My folks made me go to church when I was four years old. I don't care about any of that. But I said, buddy, you have no place to go right now but up. You're going down into the ditch. At least give them a try. See, even there, some would reject the precious love of the gospel of Jesus. 
and they would find themselves sublimating themselves into the ditch, I call it. But he was so willing, our Lord, so willing to lift those people up in that program we were offering. Fantastic power. And some did take advantage. They received the blessing of the Holy Spirit and went out and did great things, got jobs, made families, and worshiped the Lord. That's the best part. They worshiped the Lord. Yeah, that's what I, I have done that. I've seen that. I know it's possible. And so we have those same powers, all of us, the same power of Jesus in the Holy Spirit of God. We do. So, dear friends, the bridge, John the baptizer. I baptize, I baptize you, he says, from the forgiveness of sins, but one is coming and one has arrived. He baptizes you in the Holy Spirit. So that we can actually answer the two questions. Who is Jesus? And what does he mean to me? Let's bow our heads. Most Holy Father, we're so grateful for the things you offer us in your Son, Jesus, our Lord. Bless us, take care of us, lift us up, surround us with your holy angels, keeping us safe in all things. You indeed are the Lord of life, risen from the dead in your name. Amen. This week, please respond with, Lord, have mercy. Today, we pray, uh, dear Lord, that the Lord's face would shine on us, that we may be saved, and that Christ would lead us in straight paths as he once led Joseph like a flock, bringing us out of the bondage of our sins and planting us securely in his eternal promises. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for diligent and faithful pastors that like John the forerunner, they would preach repentance for the forgiveness of sins and herald the Messiah. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for us and for our fellow citizens that God would preserve us from placing our trust in princes and mortal men who come and go like grass before his breath. For our nation, that God would give rulers who will rule after his good pleasure, keeping order and protecting life, and for godly quietness and honesty. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the sick and the sorrowing, that the shepherd of Israel would give ear to, the, to their need, especially those we name in our hearts right now. And for healing, courage, and perseverance to all who cry out to God, that they may find comfort in his enduring word and the certain hope of the resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for the Lord's patience and his spirit, that when we have strayed from his commandments, we may be drawn back to him in repentance. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray for all who commune this day, that we may receive this sacrament rightly as Christ's true medicine of immortality, and that with faith strengthened and sins forgiven, we may live in holiness and godliness. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray in the memory of the saints before us who rest in the Lord's presence, and for the church on earth awaiting the coming of Christ, that God would preserve us both until he gathers us to himself in the new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Heavenly Father, for the sake of Christ Jesus, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. <laughs>